a lot of brands don't understand how people feel about their products or their experiences. And even when they collect that data, they're not quite sure how to turn that data into actionable steps. If you're a store and you're only competing based on your product and price, based on your selection, it's going to be very hard to stay relevant. So you have to compete based on experience. So the focus initially was to leverage technology to help retailers measure and improve their in-store experience. We really have to start thinking about the total experience, being able to decouple and understand how customers are engaging, but then using the data that we're capturing in stores to create a circular feedback loop and smart feedback loop that can help us better serve customers. Hi, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. Welcome to the BOF podcast. It's Friday, August 6th. At the recent BOF Professional Summit, What's a Store For?, our retail columnist Doug Stevens was joined by Brittany Hicks and Jessica Couch of Fayetteville Road and Alexei Agrachev, co-founder and chief executive of in-store analytics firm Retail Next, to discuss how retailers can use data to improve customer experiences. Just as retail itself has changed dramatically over the past few years, so have a retailer's most important metrics of success which are not just about sales. Here's Doug, Brittany, Jessica, and Alexei at the BOF Professional Summit. Beyond the distribution of products, stores, of course, are now taking on many new roles. They are studios, they are stages, they are logistics and customer service hubs, and ultimately they are an important form of media. And yet too many retailers today are relying on the same old industrial metrics to measure those physical stores that they have been for decades, if not centuries. Uh, But my next panel, my guests here, are aiming to change that. They are on the vanguard of a movement to expand the thinking of retailers beyond traditional metrics, taking into account many of these new uses for physical stores and how to gauge success in those physical stores. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about them. Brittany Hicks and Jessica Couch are the founders of man- and managing partners of Fayetteville Road, a turnkey boutique agency that leverages technology to build customized solutions to match people to products, creating innovative experiences for an inclusive marketplace. Jessica is an academic researcher with a master's in fashion technology from Cornell and a certificate in product development from UVA. She's a two-time startup founder herself and has worked with over 200 brands and clients to meet the needs of their customers, curating what she calls smart feedback loops, which we'll talk more about in a moment. Brittany's an ex-Amazonian who has managed hundreds of hyper-growth brands during her 10 years in the retail industry across retail and merchandising, leveraging an expertise in negotiation and vendor management. And they are joined by Alexei Agrachev. I've known uh, Alexei now for the better part of 12 years. He's the co-founder and chief executive of Retail Next, the world's first technology company dedicated to providing advanced in-store analytics for brick and mortar retail businesses. And before founding Retail Next in 2007, Alexei spent eight years at Cisco Systems, and he is also on the alumni of the Silicon Valley Business Journal's 40 Under 40. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you being here. Alexei, I wanna start with you. Um, let's, Let's start first of all with the what. And, and then we'll sort of move to the how and the why. But what are we able to understand today in physical retail environments that we couldn't understand or glean even 14 years ago when you founded your company? Yeah, well, thanks, Doug. First of all, it's great to be here and uh, thanks for having me. So yeah, when we, and, and when we started the company in end of 2007, beginning of 2008, the idea behind that business was that the stores were never going to go away. We believe that very strongly that in a lot of uh, categories, it actually become more important as a customer acquisition vehicle, as a place to introduce products. But at the same time, if you're a store and you're only competing based on your product and price, based on your selection, it's going to be very hard to stay relevant. So you have to compete based on experience. So the focus initially was to leverage technology to help retailers measure and improve their in-store experience. That's what we focused on for the last 13 years. And from an actual data, a what, it is pretty amazing what you can capture now automatically in in, on very, very large scale, what we're doing across tens of thousands of stores across 100 plus countries and seeing billions and billions of uh, uh, shopping visits. So you can automatically today understand not just how many people walk past the store, 
what percentage of them you capture, which is actually a very important metric. Of course, you can understand your traffic, a lot about the traffic, you know, in terms of your demographics, male, female, approximate age, new repeat visitor, last time they were in the store, how much time people spend in the store. And then more importantly, you can understand pretty much everything they do inside the store, including which merchandise they interact with, where they browse, where they spend time, whether they try things on, and how they interact with sales associates which I think is very important. So it's very, very rich data you can capture about every customer walking through your retail store. And then in our, in our view, I think the most important things the stores can do to be great is by constantly investing in tools and processes to listen and respond to their customers. And actually, I think all of us on this panel, that's kind of what we do in different ways. But that gives you an idea of the kind of data you can capture of course, combining that with point of sale and what happens online and everything else and makes it a, a very different way of running your stores from what people were doing, frankly, from what a lot of people are still doing today and certainly from what people were doing a decade ago. Yeah, indeed. And, and you know, the old adage, I guess, Alexei, is that um, just simply because you can measure something doesn't necessarily mean that you should or it doesn't necessarily make it, it important. How do you, where do you start with, with a retail uh, company in terms of, sorting that out uh, you know what what are the primary metrics that they they should be going after versus what they can collect i guess it's a matter of you know uh, do we try and boil the ocean or or do we focus on the data that we really believe is integral to our experience where do you start with clients in terms of creating that geography yeah and you you absolutely right in fact if i you know i would say probably the first 30 meetings I had with retailers back in 08, 09, which wasn't, also wasn't a great time for brick and mortar retail, uh, you know, coming out of the financial crisis. The first answer we got was we already have too much data. It's, we don't know what to do with it. So, and you know, and, and that's part of the reason our company is called Retail Next and we only do retail is because the only way to make this data relevant is by really understanding how people will use it and make it very, very obvious and easy for them. In terms of where to start, it is, so the interesting thing is, of course, you know, just understanding your traffic and conversion and how, you know, you improve what we talk about the shopper yield, which is really dollars per shopper walking through the front door. How do you improve your productivity of the store? There's a lot of things you can focus on just that. We, we have a, uh, a, you know, a product that's called Retail Labs, where you cover the entire store and you, you, you measure very, very rich, you know, shopper path through the store. And usually those retail labs in a test and learn environment are used to test new formats, new layouts, new merchandising concepts, new sales associate engagement program platform. And the interesting thing is when COVID hit, when everything locked down, I would say 90 plus percent of our install base were classified as non-essential retailers. They were all forced to shut down and their sales went for at least a couple months to zero. A lot of them had massive liquidity issues, right? Publicly, you know, furloughed up to 80, 90% of their workforce. I expected that product because it's kind of strategic and not that you know inexpensive to to sort of fall off people's radar. That was our fastest growing product yesterday. It actually, I mean, yesterday last year it tripled because everybody that w had a physical footprint, including a lot of brands that actually didn't and started investing in it, they wanted to really reimagine the way they use their store. They wanted to reimagine how they use it, how they engage customers, how they uh, how they do it, and then so people are very interested in in understanding that rich, you know, path, rich engagement in a store, because frankly, the store is a better platform to learn about your customers than online sure. now. It didn't sure. used to be. It so used to be this black hole. Now that's where you learn more about your customers. So, yeah. So it's, so it's not, not just a matter of implementing the technology to gather data, but p potentially using it as a means of experimentation and testing as well. And that sort of brings me to um, Brittany and Jessica. Um, a friend of mine, Rachel Sheckman, who was the founder of Story in, in New York City, uh, once said something that stuck with me. And she said, rent is the cost of customer acquisition today, uh, as opposed to being a cost of distribution. And I know that a lot of your work involves helping retailers connect with niche segments and, and in particular people of color. Can you walk us through how how exactly it is that you, you work with clients to identify those segments and, and an approach to them? Absolutely. So we typically take a scientific approach, just like we would be product managers for a technology company. The first thing we want to do is identify the personas and archetypes. And what we find is a lot of times we generalize people of color or we have assumptions about how they actually want to shop. 
What we do is collect valuable data from the actual consumers to better understand what type of shoppers they are. What are they motivated by? What are their interests in coming in the store? Once we have that type of information, we can then innovate and ideate around how do we capture their interest and then how do we think about retention? It's great to have people walk through your store once, but you really want them to come into the store, build a relationship with you, go online and stay within your ecosystem when they're shopping and always have you as top of mind. So we really like to collect a lot of data on the actual people, develop those personas, and also begin to innovate and ideate around that. So how are you testing that out in, I mean, I know that in, in the online world, it's it's easy to make on the on the fly changes to your marketing, to your positioning, to your product mix. It's it's perhaps even more easy to personalize uh, your communication with a consumer. H- how how does that play out for you in physical store environments? How do you go about doing that sort of testing to try and find the right approach to connecting with those consumer groups? Absolutely. Um, In a space, you have the opportunity to A-B test in a way that you would similarly to online. So when you take a space and you activate and you have events or you have something that really draws the customer in, it's really easy to set up various opportunities to test methods and, you know, our hypothesis on what we think, which technology will work the best. And then we observe them. And while we're observing customers move through experiences, we pay attention to how long they're spending in a certain area. How are they interacting with the type of technology? Which products are they passing by? Are they, you know, maneuvering to the back of a rack to see a different product or style? Or are they simply surface level and looking directly at the front? I think one of the things we do best is just observe. We really observe customer behavior because all technology simply facilitates existing behaviors versus trying to create new behaviors. And Brittany, feel free to correct me if I left anything out, but that's typically how we approach that when we're thinking about the in-store method. Yeah, I would completely agree. And I would say as a follow-up to what Alexi already alluded to, the store environment is the best space to really understand how your customer is engaging with your products. We know that there's a huge focus right now on the growth in omnichannel, um, but 85% of retail is still happening in physical stores in the U.S. And so it's really important for us to understand what customers are looking for and how they're engaging. And if we can observe their behavior in stores, we can understand their preferences. And in addition to understanding that behavior, we can also make modifications to our assortment that can really speak to the specific needs of niche consumers or people of color and the types of products they're looking for. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach when you're thinking about the physical store experience, but also the products that they're looking for when they come in to shop with you. It's a, it's a great point. And you raise, it, you raise another interesting point, and that is that you, you're quite right. The vast majority of product sales pre-pandemic, of course, were taking place in physical stores. Uh, and that and that uh, remains the case today. Uh, but having said that, we also know that China just crossed the threshold. Uh, during the pandemic, China went 52% e-commerce, so 52% of the retail economy now being transacted online. I guess my question, and I'll throw it out to all of you, is what do you what do you do? What what do you measure if if the sale actually ceases to be sort of the anchor metric that we treat it as today? Uh, the ultimate sign of success, if you will. What do you do if that becomes the minority? If physical stores become the minority source uh, or, or uh, you know, channel for product purchase, how do you now begin to gauge success? So I think that's a very important question. Looking at China, while yes, they've uh, the online sales reach over fifty percent. We look at our luxury customers in China, for example, and actually as stores reopen. Most of the luxury stores are running double digit comps to 2019 pre pandemic time. And in somehow that's happening not at expense necessarily of online sales, the online sales. So it's on top of that. But to me, you mentioned something earlier, Doug, how, you know, store is or your rent is the customer acquisition expense. And I think if you look at your store as your best marketing and the best way to acquire customers, especially in a world where we've all talked about leading up to pandemic, how the cost of Facebook ads went up 10x in you know, five, six, seven years, not, not even. And then now with the new tracking changes uh, with Apple, there's more uncertainty around ability to acquire customers online. Stores as a customer acquisition vehicle, when done right, are unbelievably powerful. And that's where you're measuring 
that on terms of right. I mean, we've all talked about how when you open a store, uh, if you're a pure e-com player, you see your sales in those regions go up almost every single time, right? And then you you can capture customers in a very different way. It's also a way, a place where you can differentiate yourself in a way you can't online. To me, if you run an e-commerce website, if you have a product that no one can buy anywhere else and that everybody wants, I guess it doesn't matter. But outside of that, it's actually almost impossible to do something online that truly differentiates yourself as a brand outside of building a unique content and unique community, which is certainly possible, but very difficult. In the store, if you get the experience right, which is hard, and you can scale that, it's so difficult to replicate that it becomes a true differentiator. And if you want to build a relationship with a customer, like acquiring those customers in the store tends to be a much more lasting relationship. And I think there are, and that's focusing a lot of your measurement on that, along with, by the way, I'm a believer that stores should be run profitably almost 100% of the time, even if they're also some of your best marketing, but still you have to measure the customer acquisition side as well as the, the sales and the profitability of the store. And I guess that leads me to another question, and that is that, if it, it, and I agree with you, believe me, I am I am the ultimate uh, cheerleader for that point of view. Uh, and, and I've maintained for a long time that stores are media. The problem is we're not capturing the value of that media. When we go out and buy media on the open market, we are capturing the value of it, obviously, as an expense. But when we generate media through physical stores, and as you point out, Alexei, potentially some of the best media for customer acquisition that a brand might have, we're not valuing that. We're not capturing that value and putting it back to the bottom line. Or, or are we? Are there brands out there that you know of that are capturing the value of their physical stores as a media channel today? I mean, the, there are uh, multi-brand concepts that are 100% focused on customer acquisition and engagement, right? So I think Beta was the first one that launched, and then there's companies like Showfields and Neighborhood Goods, and then there's actually a large, uh, you know, large Best Buy type of retail in the Middle East that's moving to that model where they are multi-brand retailers where a person can walk in, buy a product, walk out with that product, you know, pay for it. 100% of the sell-through goes to the brands, the makers of the products. The profit goes to them. They control the pricing. But you know, the way that retailers make money is by providing space and providing very rich data around how many people engage with your product, walk by, how many people see a demo, et cetera, and they charge for that. There are more and more concepts like that. And actually, some of the big multi-brand retailers are starting to move in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big shift. So that's promising for sure. Uh, Jessica, Fayetteville... Your your byline for your company is that you work with retailers to really connect those retailers to niche segments and, and uh, you say match people to products. Now, a lot of retailers, uh, maybe out of hubris, would say, well, we already do that, right? We're, we're already good at doing that. Um, but from your standpoint, where are most retailers falling short in, in terms of their understanding of these various customer segments. And frankly, I'll, I'll add to the question, are the technologies that we are using today, are they robust enough to really do the kind of micro segmenting in physical stores that we, that we should be doing? Absolutely, I think we have enough technologies that would allow us to do the segmentation necessary. But where I think a lot of retailers are falling short are simply on the innovation side and understanding that we're in a consumer-centric economy, which means you need to understand your consumer on a more personalized level. It's not you know, good enough to just say, oh, well, you know, our customer, this girl likes to shop and she eats here and she makes this amount of money. Those type of metrics mean nothing anymore. What we need to measure now is you know, really understanding how often is this person coming into your store? Where are they coming from? What communities are they a part of? How do you reach that community? And then what are their sentiments about your brand and experience? And that is what we're seeing, that there is a disconnect. A lot of brands don't understand how people feel about their products or their experiences. And even when they collect that data, they're not quite sure how to turn that data into actionable steps. And, you know, um, there's a disconnect. So a lot of people use social media to voice their opinions on whether or not they've had a great customer service experience. But if you're not scraping that data and then analyzing that data properly and then putting it back into your experience or putting it back into the design, you're really missing a key opportunity. 
right now we say it like um, you have to court your customer like you're dating them. And you're not just dating anybody. You're dating someone with a lot of options, which means you really have one time to wow them. And then you really have one time to really capture them. And when they leave, you're not just you know, losing one customer, you're losing that community now. And when you have so many options, you absolutely have to have a personalized relationship with your customer personas and archetypes so that you can make sure every touch point of your brand feeds the need of that customer. And when we say match people to products, we mean that on a one-to-one. We mean real sustainability. We mean that you're not making arbitrary products in arbitrary sizes or colorways if you're in beauty, you're making products that you know is needed by your customer base and you're fulfilling those needs as often as possible. And, and Brittany, tell me about more about, you talk about smart feedback loops uh, and how brands can sort of establish that, that uh, continual feedback with consumers and, and ultimately be parsing the right data coming directly off of those engagements. Can you talk to me about how you actually build the architecture of those feedback loops for companies? From my perspective, this kind of goes back to your previous question of understanding how we can use the in-store experience to invest in the experience overall, where we should really be considering the in-store experience as a larger part of the supply chain. And if we can understand enough about our customers to improve their customer experience in-store, then upstream, we should be seeing cost savings and reducing our footprint in terms of returns and other things that would be detrimental to the brand overall. And so we really have to start thinking about the total experience, um, being able to decouple and understand how customers are engaging, but then using the data that we're capturing in stores to create a circular feedback loop and smart feedback loops that can help us better serve customers. And so in terms of how we build that architecture, Um, around doing that, it can be in a number of ways. Um, We can look at the floor experience or floor plans. We can plan a gram and build architecture that really speaks to how customers want to experience products in store. Do they want to shop by category? Do they want to shop in a way that you're not presenting products at the moment? So testing that on an iterative basis to understand how to better present products and present your assortment to them. Or we could look at something as simple as language that you're using in your marketing and making sure that, as Jessica mentioned before, you're speaking to communities with language that they're using that's important to them to identify um, something as simple as hair texture or complexion or fit for an apparel product. So in terms of how we build that architecture, um, it can be really specific to the woman that you're speaking to. And as she already mentioned, it has to be on a one-to-one basis because it needs to capture her experience and the totality of who she is as a consumer because she has so many options now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure she does. Um, And and, and on that note, I just want to sort of shift to personalization because ultimately I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about building store experiences that feel personalized, feel customized to each individual consumer and their tastes and preferences. It's a realm that we're very familiar with online. We're being trained by online companies now to expect that our experiences and our engagements are going to be somewhat customized, personalized recommendation engines and personalization engines are becoming commonplace. In the retail environment, that is not the case. But my question, I guess, and I'll I'll open it up broadly, is do do we foresee a time in the future where we will get to a point where a physical store experience can literally be completely different for two different consumers who happen to be in that store at the same time, but are experiencing that store, that brand, that that experience in a very, very different and more personalized way. Are we going to get there? And what needs to happen for us to, to get there? Absolutely. I'd like to say we absolutely will get there. It's almost already happening. You see, what we have when we have our cell phones is we have a very personalized experience right there. And no matter who's walking into your store, if you could understand what they're looking for, you can navigate them through your store in a more personalized way. It's just right now we haven't connected all of the existing technology. We don't need any type of special or magic wand. We just need to connect these experiences. When I walk into a store, you should know who I am what I bought from you, 
or what my taste preference is, and then navigate me through the store in that way. Even if it's something as simple as navigate me to the products that fit me, that's a personalization tool that could be so helpful and that could help people hurry up and get to the purchase decision, which is most important. So I do believe we're getting there. We just have to pull all these tech pieces together and help people understand how simple it is to really innovate in that way. The one thing that stores have, yeah. yeah. The one thing stores have that online doesn't have is sales associates, which I actually think is a huge advantage. And I am not at all a believer that sales associates are going to be automated, but I'm a huge believer in leveraging technology to automate non-selling tasks of non-selling of non-selling tasks of sales associates. Today, a typical person working in a store spend a ton of time on mind-numbing non-selling tasks that actually can be automated, and there's some great technology that's taking care of that. If you do that, then you can have better trained, higher paid sales associates, and then you focus uh, on giving them tools to understand their customers. If you do that, by definition, uh, almost every shopping experience will be personalized. The only other quick thing I will mention is that personalization in stores doesn't mean always just one-on-one. -on -one. Even if you just invest in understanding the kind of shopper that typically shops a store on a Tuesday morning versus Saturday afternoon, how it changes seasonally uh, with weather, other things, and you make even slight adjustments to serve that customer better, the stores, you will see results, right? So there's both that one-on-one -on -one personalization, which I actually think a sales associate is the best way to deliver that in store and giving them tools and training to know how to do that. And two, how do you just constantly, you know, focus your store on addressing the type of customer that's there on like, even if it's not one-on-one, -on -one, still just trying to do it, you will be a better store and you will see results. And, and, and on that note, I just want to raise the specter of privacy. Um, what I find interesting is that, you know, we all know that we're being tracked. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an open issue now. We all know that we're being tracked. We know that there's the ongoing debate right now over cookies uh, or the elimination of cookies as a convention. Um, but ultimately, you know, we've all been there where we look at something on Instagram and then for the next six days, we get nothing but ads for that, for that product. And, and we've all, I think, sort of just sort of, you know, we, we've become accustomed to that. But surveys also show that in the physical world, consumers are much, much more precious about their privacy, especially when we begin tracking their bodies. I guess my question is, um, how do how should retailers navigate that with consumers? How can retailers begin to, in fact, make consumers feel more comfortable with that? Is there some sort of an exchange of value that needs to happen in order for consumers to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm cool with you, um, you know, following me in essence, as long as you give me a better experience? Like, are we going to net out to a level of comfort with this, I guess is my question. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, obviously we, I mean, so we are in that world and we have deployments in, you know, Switzerland and France and Germany and Japan, Australia, call it the most, you know, privacy forward countries, both in terms of legislation, but even more importantly, in some cases, in terms of consumer attitude, right? Because that matters to brands. And to me, there's two things. One is there's an aggregated level of understanding what's happening in your store. Can you in an aggregated anonymous way understand how people shop the store. So you're constantly removing friction points and making the experience better. And frankly, that retailers that we had big concern initially when we came to Japan, all the brands said, everybody's concerned about privacy. And then we had a big brand, did a big private uh, public launch of using this technology to improve their customer experience. And actually it helped with their customer perception because it's, if consumers see that you're investing in using technology to make experience better and better. It's no different from, you know, understanding traffic flow so you can route that. Second one is, will a consumer give you permission to recognize them as an individual so they can greet you, as was said earlier, and like provide your personalized experience? That has to be very, very explicit. And I haven't seen any big brand to try to you know, add some terms and conditions in their app or other stuff and do that in a secret way, because frankly, the downside outweighs the upside. The only way people are doing it is by saying, hey, if you give us permission to recognize you, here's what we're going to do for you with that experience is going to be genuinely special. And I think customers are fine with that. And that's frankly the way so almost every single brand, at least in the U.S., is, is moving forward. So, so it's a true exchange. And I'm so glad you said that, because I feel like most of the time, retailers take the approach that we have to sort of, you know, nefariously take what data we can 
and deploy that data without the consumer knowing. Last last question in the last seven seconds here that I have, and I'll ask it to Brittany and Jessica. Who's doing it right, in your opinion? Is there a brand out there that can be an exemplar for our audience? Yeah, I think Nordstrom is doing a great job. They um, We helped them conduct a really huge survey with over a thousand women of color to figure out you know, what is missing from the experience and how do you want to shop for beauty products? And I think Nordstrom's taken an approach of, you can simply ask the customers what they want. They will agree to give you their data and their information, and then we can use it to iterate and create better experiences. And I think that their approach to customer centristic practices is the best way to move forward. You really can just ask. Customers love to talk to you about what they want, and then you implement. So I think you all will see that Nordstrom will be a leader in that space as a result. Wonderful. Well, there we have now an example to follow. Brittany, Jessica, Alexi, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the BOF podcast for our look inside fashion and how it connects to currents in the wider world. If you're not yet a BOF professional member, join today with our 30-day risk-free trial and benefit from exclusive access to agenda-setting analysis you won't find anywhere else. The BOF podcast is edited and produced by Emma Clark, Kate Bartan, and Kevin Bobby Blanco in the BOF studio team.